Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series, a digital program brought to you in 2020, featuring fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare industry. This week's episode focuses on anti-COVID therapeutics with James Glass from Gilead, Mark Williams from Eli Lilly, and David Thomas from Bio. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We're thrilled you're here with us um, for another interesting installment of our virtual breakfast series. Special thanks go to the law firm Moses and Singer for being our sponsor this month. Um, today, um, as, as in several, actually, Derek, I don't, I don't think we've had a breakfast that we haven't discussed COVID. <laughs> it's, it's been topical. It's come yes. up. <laughs> it's legitimate because COVID is the whole reason that we're doing these virtual breakfasts, right, in, in, the, in the first place. Um, so today we really are going to dive into COVID therapeutics. As those of you who join us regularly know, um, several weeks ago, we had Pfizer's vaccines team on to talk about specifically about their vaccine development and how it was being distributed. And today we are going to talk about therapeutics that can help us if, if you do end up with COVID, um, what the options are for treatments and what the pipeline looks like. Um, so we have an esteemed panel of guests today. As always, uh, please ask your questions in the chat or the Q&A box. And Derek and I will get to those as we go through the conversation and we will, um, we will be glad to ask your questions of our expert panelists. With that, I will turn it over to Derek to more fully introduce our panel and then we'll get our discussion started. So thanks everybody. All right, thank you so much, Jennifer and good morning, everybody. Uh, this is really exciting for me because I think one of the things that we tend to like to focus on is all of the different things that our, that our industry can do. And, you know, while the spotlight has rightfully been on vaccines, uh, you know, no amount of small effort has been spent looking at what are some of the other ways that we can actually put uh, tools in the, in the toolkits of our caregivers and what are some of the other ways that we may be able to uh, help patients avoid severe consequences of COVID-19. So we're really fortunate this morning to have uh, three exceptional guests, uh, David Thomas from Bio, Mark Williams from Eli Lilly, uh, and James Class from Gilead, uh, who can all hit on different aspects of targeted anti-COVID therapeutics. So gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I'd like uh, each of you to take a minute, just introduce yourselves, give a little bit of background, and uh, we do have some slides and some presentations. And after the back, after the introductions, we'll go into those. So. Uh, we'll go around the horn. David, why don't you start? Sure. My name is David Thomas, and I'm the head of industry research at Bio, and I've been there since 2008. And my job there is to keep track of the pipeline and investment across the industry. Prior to that, I worked as a biochemist um, at small biotechs and, and large pharma. All right, James, over to you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, my name is uh, James Class, and uh, I've been in Gilead for about uh, three and a half years. Uh, I lead IP value and innovation policy uh, in the public policy team. Uh, and rather interestingly, in the pandemic uh, last year, I was basically detailed to be kind of uh, Gilead's uh, liaison to the World Health Organization uh, around the development of remdesivir, which we'll discuss today. Yep. Over to you, Mark. Yes, good morning, Mark Williams. I'm a uh, pulmonary critical care physician. I um, am the senior global medical director for the COVID-19 platform at Eli Lilly, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. All right. Well, we're really glad to have all of you here with us. This is going to be a great discussion. Uh, we've got a great audience. Uh, audience, just so you know, you can, uh, you can lob questions in through the Q&A portal or through the chat. Uh, Jennifer and I will be actively monitoring that throughout the conversation, and we're really looking forward to it. So, David, if you've got some slides, why don't we kick off with you? Great. Let's see. How does that look? Perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay, so... Uh, thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to show you four slides, um, and what is in those slides is going to be focused on therapeutics, but the first slide is really the overall numbers and response uh, that we've had as an industry to COVID-19 uh, since January of last year, and then touch on what physicians have to work with right now, and then do a, a summary of 
what's coming in the therapeutic pipeline. And what we do is break that down into antivirals, which are drugs that directly or indirectly disrupt the ability of the virus to replicate and treatments, which are for the secondary effects of the infection, inflammation, um, pulmonary function, coagulation, et cetera. And of note, we keep track of this pipeline data that you'll see on our COVID tracker. You can see the, the URL there. We update that every, every Monday. So since the sequence was published uh, from China on January 10th last year, we've had 939 drug programs launched. And this is by a press release announcement of the companies. Um, it is unprecedented in any, indi any indication uh, that we have within biopharma. Nothing is this big and has moved this fast. 25% of those drug programs were vaccines. 29% in the antiviral group. It's over 270 antivirals. And just under half, 46% are in that treatment category. And that the treatment category grew quite quickly and makes up the largest in part because 90% of those compounds were either repurposed, uh, old generics, for example, or redirected from ongoing projects, um, like I said, in, in inflammation, uh, even in cancer that were brought over into the COVID-19 pipeline. It's also noteworthy that 73% of these therapeutics come from small companies something that we've seen even outside of COVID and in previous reports that we've put together. When you look at the whole pipeline, it's, it's roughly 70% of all projects in biopharma are actually coming from, from small companies and even recent FDA approvals, about two thirds from small companies and half of those originating in, in the United States. So we had 939 launched, but only 818 remain active today. So I think we are the, the only group that's keeping track of compounds that are failing or that are inactive. Some of these launched in China over a year ago and not a single data readout or press release. Uh, we can pretty much assume that those are inactive um, since lack of patients, uh, et cetera. Uh, so we're reaching 100 programs that are now failing. And this is also very indicative of our industry. It is an industry where we have 90% failure and we're gonna likely see that in the COVID-19 pipeline as well. It's very important to point that out to the general public. Uh, we have had wins and in the United States, in terms of authorizations, we now have uh, eight total authorizations, three of which are vaccines, uh, which you've all heard about and probably have received already. Um, and then five in that therapeutic category. There are some EUAs outside the United States. Most of those won't ever reach uh, the US, uh, lack of data, et cetera. Um, and when you look at the 800 that are active, 45% of them are now in clinical trials. So this is 371 drugs. Mm -hmm. The actual number of trials is much higher. This is specific to actual uh, molecules. So in terms of what physicians have to work with, we're gonna hear about remdesivir, uh, which now has full approval. We have three EUAs on the monoclonal antibody side and what we tier as polyclonal antibodies, the convalescent plasma still technically has an authorization for high titer concentration uh, use, but it's not used uh, very readily. And on the treatment side, there's really Eli Lilly's Illumiant the, the JAK inhibitor that we have as an authorization and dexamethasone and even dexamethasone plus Roche's Actemra are in the NIH guidelines for treatments, uh, but don't technically have that, that authorization yet. So it's a pretty limited amount uh, on, on the treatment side, which is the opposite case when you look at, at the pipeline and what's um, in, in the clinical trials. Before I get to the treatments, we'll, Put up the slide for antivirals and I'll show you where we are with, with treatments. So for antivirals, 239 total programs, 71 are now in clinical stage. And the way we break this down is in these different tiers. So the tier zero are, are drugs that are binding to the virus on the outside 
of the, the, the virus itself. So you know, the spike protein, but there are, are other components, the membrane, the nucleocapsid, the, the, the um, envelope protein, um, et cetera. And those you can see in blue in the pie chart. So right now, full monoclonal antibodies, we have 22 um, coming in behind you know, Regeneron, Eli Lilly. Uh, there are a number of, of fully human monoclonal antibodies a couple in the clinic and a couple of um, antibody-like compounds. We have NK and CAR-T therapies and also uh, various small molecules and peptides um, that are in the clinic right now. In tier one, those are what we refer to as interior targets, but really they're genomic products of CoV-2 itself. And there are potentially about five or so druggable targets. Right now, only two are being worked on. Remdesivir is an example of one of those where you have the RNA polymerase um, of, of the virus being a target and the other being the m -pro protease. So those, it, out of this whole group of antivirals are probably the most important to watch and where a lot of effort going forward should be directed. Um, that's my opinion, but it's also precedent when we look at other infectious diseases, um, other viruses where we've had wins. It's really going after proteases and other replication um, enzymes from the genome itself of the virus. So the Merck Ridgeback compound, malnupiravir, is in phase three, um, focusing now, um, as of a couple of weeks ago, more on early stage patients as opposed to late stage hospitalized. And the Roche ATA compound, AT527, that is um, also an RNA polymerase inhibitor. And those are oral therapies. Uh, so they could be used potentially in even earlier setting as opposed to the hospitalized uh, IV setting. Uh, we also have uh, a new entrant from Dalcor. This was a, a CETP inhibitor that seems to bind to the COV-2 protease now in phase two. And the only drug that's been specifically developed against the protease of COV-2 uh, that is in the clinic is Pfizer. Um, Pfizer has two compounds now, one in phase 1B and one in phase 1, that specifically bind to the, to the protease. So those four drug programs are, are top of the list in terms of what we have as strategies for antivirals. And going down the list of tiers here, we have human targets that can disrupt replication, the trafficking of the virus, the, the entry, looking at host or, or human um, proteases that allow uh, the ACE2 combination with the spike protein to get into the cell. We do have ongoing programs there that have advanced, some of which just in the last quarter have, have released positive phase two data, pushing them into, into phase three. So that's where we are with antivirals. And the last slide here is with treatments, you know, over 200 clinical stage treatment programs ongoing right now. 59 of those are phase three or phase four late stage programs. And the breakdown is mostly anti-inflammatory on the right-hand side here. It's almost 50% in the anti-inflammatory category. We subdivide that uh, into cytokine, uh, either direct binding compounds or indirect um, shutting down the cytokine storm to miscellaneous uh, anti-inflammatory targets. And then we, we do have a couple of steroids in the pipeline. And then the anticoagulants and vasodilators still in the pipeline, uh, about 25% of the late stage pipeline. Five compounds that are specific for the lungs lung damage, antifibrotics, et cetera. And then in green there, you see immune stimulants, uh, which have shown a lot of promise in, in smaller phase two studies. If you get the window right in treating COVID patients um, before they reach that, that switch into this hyperinflammatory state. And then seven, the miscellaneous category, you'll find diabetes drugs and other drugs that are, that are in late stage. And I won't go into all these, but these are some of the actual drugs or drug targets where we have seen uh, positive phase two data or some early phase three data that's indicative of um, progressing this into phase three. Um, in yellow, there are some um, slices of data that's come out where 
in, in some cases, they'll look at patients that are old or have reached um, a certain phase within that spectrum of, of oxygenation of the patient, and they actually see a positive signal, but a little bit mixed, if you will. So I will not go into all of these, but I will um, I will stop there with, with my part of the talk and uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Sure. Uh, before we go, we're going to go to James next, but we had a good question from uh, okay. the audience. It, first of all, he said, you know, it's amazing that, you know, you have 939 things in trials. He said, you know, looking ahead about two years, you know, how many, how many of these do we project is, do we think are going to be in, in regular use uh, against COVID-19? Well, I, I think that typically um, across all the indications in the industry, we have a 90% failure rate. So that's in the clinic. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these are in the, the preclinical phase. And we have a, a number, of, there are only 11 vaccines. I think they're in, in the clinic uh, or late stage clinic. Um, so a lot of those preclinical vaccines are gonna drop out and it's gonna be in that 98% uh, inactive or failure rate probably overall. Uh, so it's, it's, I guess you have to take each, each of those um, categories that I have lined out like vaccines, et cetera, um, and then apply those uh, attrition rates. And I think if you do that, um, you know, we're, we're probably well below 50 overall for the entire pipeline, um, yeah. you know, if we're lucky. And right now we're at, you know, 11 uh, in the US. So in the next two years, potentially, and a lot of those will come from uh, the treatment side, I think the the antibodies, I think it's going to depend on the variants and the ability of those antibodies to work with the variants. And then we might see a continuation. If we if we don't have that issue, you'll see more and more antibody programs shut down. I, I think this is, yeah, I, I was going to say before we go to James, I think this is just really indicative of the fact that our industry has just answered the call with with regard to COVID, you know, the, the sheer number of programs that, that were started. And, you know, we have to remember clinical trials are not free. Uh, clinical trials are not easy. Recruiting patients is not easy. None of this is easy. And, you know, I'm sure that many of the people that didn't know knew full well that it was not, you know, not a shoe in to have any of these things work the way that we wanted it to. So it, it just makes me feel good that we, we do this and we've, we've realized the amount of work that our industry has put in here. So uh, with that, James, let's go over to you. Great. Well, uh, well, thanks so much, and uh, and thanks really for the invitation uh, to uh, to come uh, speak about uh, remdesivir or uh, Veclery, uh, as it is now that it's uh, approved in the U.S. Uh, we, of course, are very thrilled, and I must say, it's you know, it's really been like a once in a career experience uh, to work on this. Although uh, I also was severely uh, sleep deprived last yeah. year, so uh, it's a don't take this the wrong way, but I hope you never get to work on another pandemic again for the rest of your career. I hope this is the only time you get to do this. You know, <laughs> I, I, will, I will take that with pleasure. <laughs> but but let, let me start. You know, just a little bit. You know, I'm I'm going to be a little less uh, scientific, but maybe uh, talk a little bit more about uh, development uh, overall. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and one thing I want to bring out right from the beginning is uh, that uh, Veclery or Remdesivir is not a repurposed drug. We actually hear this team repurposed, uh, uh, sorry, term repurposed, especially in Europe. And, you know, Remdesivir, uh, the molecule, like many of the things that you were working on, uh, was something we had worked on for years, since 2009. We originally were thinking about it for HCV. We tested it potentially against Ebola. We knew it worked against coronaviruses overall. Um, and so, but that said, it hadn't been approved for anything. It wasn't like uh, dexamethasone, which had been approved and was around. Um, this was something where we were still, you know, working to try to figure out what it would really work on. But we knew it worked on coronaviruses. And so when, uh, in of course, uh, early 2020, all of this, you know, came to the fore, we started our immediate testing, you know, and saw potential. And then, of course, I think people remember uh, after the first cases in China and the Diamond Princess, uh, a lot of things accelerated very, very quickly. Um, and, I, and I really want to come back to that point in the first quarter of uh, 2020, because, you know, I think what was really significant uh, about our example, um, you know, and, and that, that I'm certainly very proud of, is that the uh, management made the decision to invest at risk 
Um, and you might also know that, that we work with voluntary licensed partners for our HIV and HCV medicines, uh, you know, for a large part of lower middle income countries. Um, we also talk to our partners and they independently, because we can't coordinate all this, they themselves decided to invest at risk. So what this meant was, was that when we went through this uh, crazy period in the first half of the year, by May, we were, you know, starting to develop a product uh, to help get uh, the America through the summer. Um, but also our partners in India were too, so that they could actually get up to a scaled level um, in midsummer. And this is crucial because I think when you look at a lot of the debates going on right now and the activism, if anyone follows the WTO, you know, there is this assumption that these things, you know, great industry, you made these. Now, why aren't they worldwide available for everybody right now? <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's just absolutely no way around that, but, but there certainly is an aspect of that expectation. And so as you, you know, talk about uh, things, you know, with your own leadership, you might want to consider what sort of decisions you want to make uh, and, and how you want to, uh, to think about the, the world, because th these are very important factors, which uh, will certainly come back, uh, you know, if you are successful. So we, um, we in, the, in the early part of 2020, uh, went through uh, phase three uh, clinical trials, uh, you know, in a very rapid pace. Many of you may have heard of this uh, trial called ACT-1, which was run by the National Institutes of Health. Um, that was, uh, it was great uh, to partner with them. It also freed us up to run some other clinical trials, which showed that you could use remdesivir for 10 days or for five days. And, you know, and, and the, the treatment effect would be uh, relatively comparable. And that was critical because that enabled us essentially to double global supply because you could, uh, you could just use a five-day regimen uh, and mm -hmm. preserve those files. Uh, so we also tried to, uh, to build that into our program. Um, and then we had an, uh, an EUA, uh, you know, even in early May, uh, and started uh, going through a period, you know, which also folks should be aware of when you're in limited supply and you're still in that commercialization phase, um, we had to go through a period where the federal government was actually in charge of allocating remdesivir. Once again, that created tension. People tried to uh, use margin rights on us, even though they were not aware that there actually was no legal basis to use margin rights on us. Didn't stop them from trying. Uh, explain, explain for those who don't know um, what margin rights are. Sure. Yeah. So the, uh, so the Bayh-Dole Act contains a provision which allows the government to essentially march in on your patent if uh, you have either licensed uh, a product, uh, you know, licensed the IP from, a, uh, from the federal government, from a federally funded institution, uh, or in certain cases, if you partnered with a, uh, a federal institution uh, and they kind of wrote it into the contract uh, because they own a certain IP. Uh, that wasn't the case for remdesivir. None of those conditions applied, but uh, that did not stop certain attorneys general from attempting to use that uh, against us. Um, now, hopefully, uh, and we can get into this in the, in the Q&A later, hopefully the, the bad example of people trying to attack us unsuccessfully will relieve a little pressure on all of you because um, since they kind of swung and missed, uh, hopefully there's some understanding that that's not necessarily a good policy. But once again, in these kind of things, it's, a, it's high stakes. So, you know, so you need to be ready, uh, you know, for this kind of stuff. The good news is that uh, around October, we had uh, our, our plans to scale up, uh, had come to fruition. Uh, remdesivir is a small molecule, but that said, uh, the supply chain is very complex. We have a lot of rare starting materials. Everybody's thinking about supply chains nowadays. You might want to think about that as well. You know, when you scale up for, you know, for millions of courses, it's really different. And all of our vaccine colleagues know this, uh, you know, far better, uh, but it's certainly uh, important in treatments too. But we were able to, uh, to meet global demand by October um, and our voluntary license uh, partners, we, you know, we're also able to, uh, to reach uh, 56 uh, countries in the lower uh, and uh, middle income countries last year. And I think how this is all has really kind of come to a, to a, a really interesting place is with India, where now not only is Gilead donating our own uh, Vecleri from the US, we have uh, countries from Europe and everywhere else asking if they can donate their stocks to India. Everybody's really kind of coming to, but you know, it, it, it you know, kind of all goes back to those original divest, investment decisions, uh, you know, in, uh, in January of last year. Yeah. And, and, you know, kind of how that plays through. So, so I, I don't, so can you talk a little bit about, can you talk a little bit about the way the company approached communication uh, with, with the public uh, of scientific results and, and really of everything? Because I think of 
all of the therapies that we talk about, remdesivir was really kind of, you know, one of the earliest that had the potential of getting to patients. So, you know, everybody else had a little bit longer, uh, you know, development time. We actually got to see things in, in clinical trials a little bit more. Remdesivir almost felt like it was being discussed in real time. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and how the company tried to approach it? Because uh, it's, it's a huge challenge. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you go way back to uh, to January, you'll see that, that we really did not try to oversell it. And some people actually kind of made fun of our press releases because they were so matter of fact, you know, we're testing this against that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, whereas other people were looking for things that were, that were going to spring the market up. Um, but also in this environment, I mean, if people remember when, you know, Dr. Fauci was at the White House talking about, you know, the phase three results and, you know, we uh, essentially had to notify uh, the public, uh, you know, because of SEC rules that an announcement was coming before you could even talk about the data. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a certain way, you actually have to talk to your investor relations people and your legal colleagues as well to really understand, you know, what can you say and kind of on what basis and I think that the other the other thing that that I especially saw over the years is that even though everyone says uh, that you know they complain about science by press release, you know they also all do it. Uh, so uh, so for instance, I mean I, we went through an ICER review, and I remember in a conversation you know with Steve Pearson where he didn't even tell us he was doing the study. You know uh, he himself mentioned, oh well, this was kind of science by press release. Um, and so, uh, so people kind of acknowledge that there's a problem, but they aren't doing as much, uh, you know, as they should address it. And my advice would just be, you know, take the high road, you know, and stay as close to the, to the data as possible, you know, um, because, uh, you know, ultimately, um, people are going to have different opinions on things. And even in guidelines, we see guidelines uh, of completely different natures. In the UK, uh, the guidelines are saying that remdesivir probably reduces mortality. You know, the WHO says don't even use it, right? So, you know, how do you navigate all this? Just stick yeah. close to the data and keep it simple. That would be my advice. Yep. yep. I think that's I think that's good advice. And, you know, especially I'm I'm glad you brought up uh, kind of science by press release and the way you can actually communicate with investors because you know, notably you you didn't pump anything up and it was all it was all data. I think that was actually a really good example to set for kind of many that came after. Um, so why don't we transition over to uh, Mark uh, at this point, and then we can get into we can get into Q and A after. All right, you got it, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Can you can you can see the slides? Okay, there. got it. Got it. Okay, sorry. Well, once again, um, thank you very much for the kind invitation to present. I'm going to talk about uh, our uh, two antibody combination, which is bamlanivimab and adesivimab. And I have uh, have some slides that we really are um, mandatory to show just for uh, um, regulatory reasons. So we are under an emergency use authorization for bamlanivimab and adesivimab together for the treatment of COVID-19. But I won't just... Uh, um, stick to the slides. I'll try to have some commentary and be look forward to any questions. So Lily, uh, I think um, it's fair to say made a, a big investment in resources personnel uh, early in the pandemic. And just over a year ago, really started this journey and, and has been quite, um, I would say quite proud of of some of the contributions that we've been able to make in partnership, in partnership with uh, fantastic uh, relationships, I think, with US government, particularly the HHS around consumer awareness. And so, and then also I would give uh, some salutations to the FDA. I think the FDA uh, has, has performed very well, in my opinion, under uh, very difficult circumstances with this just once in a, 100 year uh, pandemic. So with that, I will try to advance. So again, uh, FDA issued an emergency use authorization to permit this emergency use of, of these unapproved. So these, these monoclonal antibodies, unlike remdesivir, do not have a formal approval. They're granted emergency use authorization. So we have 
bamlanivimab at a dose of 700 milligrams and adesivimab at a, at a dose of, um, this should be 1400 milligrams. Together for, these are for adult patients or children who are 12 years of age or more um, who have recent positive COVID-19 testing and who are at high risk progressing to severe COVID-19 and or hospitalization. So we're going to talk about what that means here in a moment. What does high risk mean? Because it's it's an important clarification regarding the emergency use of, of these particular monoclonal antibodies. So it's important to point out who these uh, therapeutics are not indicated for. So they're not indicated for hospitalized patients, unlike from Disavir. They're not indicated for people who are on oxygen therapy. Uh, and they're also not, not indicated for people who may be on baseline oxygen therapy for, for emphysema, but now, now that's worsening at home and their oxygen requirements are going up. So we, we know that these drugs uh, appear to be most uh, efficacious if they're used early and they're used in the ambulatory setting. And I think that makes sense by the nature of how these, these drugs are purported to work. So this is a very busy slide. What I want to focus on, this is the emergency use disclaimer. What I would encourage everyone to do is to go to the website, www.bamandeddy.com. Lots of very important information on there for, for not just healthcare providers, but also for patients and caregivers. We do have important safety information I do need to point out. Uh, again, these drugs are not approved, so we have some limited clinical data. But what we do know is that in general, we would uh, argue scientifically that these drugs have been proven to be relatively safe. There is a rare reaction of a, 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 an anaphylaxis. Uh, we've seen that on a very rare basis. More common, you might see some infusion-related reactions where a patient is receiving administration of, of the monoclonals and has some symptoms that, that are varied here. So you, you see a lot of these symptoms you might imagine are also consistent with COVID-19. But we think there is a, a, a possible adverse reaction regarding infusion. Thankfully, most of these are, are very short-lived uh, short and, and um, with some basic treatments uh, are resolved very quickly. It's always uh, part of a, a label to, to remark about some potential uh, side effects. And so there is a potential that the COVID-19 symptoms actually may worsen after, after administration of these two drugs. Uh, we think that's a pretty rare event. And then again, we have data that uh, looking at these two drugs together, the most common reported adverse effect is actually uh, was nausea. And then we have some itching of the skin and some fever. Um, but overall, we would argue that these, these drugs appear to be relatively well tolerated. And then finally, we don't really have any extensive information in pregnancy or women who are breastfeeding. And so those are also important safety information to share. Okay, with that, uh, I want to dive just a little bit into um, the history of this program. And so we, we know quite a lot about this virus. We had sort of a dry run, if you will, if you remember back to the original SARS outbreak, um, which uh, thankfully was relatively self-contained. It, it obviously had nothing in terms of the epidemiology that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 did. But we learned about this, this particular coronavirus species uh, quite a lot then, and we benefited from that, I think, quite early. So we know the spike protein here, the, these red spikes outside of the virus are ultra important for the early pathogenesis. And so the, the thinking is that if you could develop monoclonal antibodies that would bind to the spike protein, therefore it would prevent its interaction with the ACE2 receptor, which sits predominantly on, on respiratory epithelial cells, but also it can sit on other organs, maybe like the heart and some other uh, critical organs. So uh, quite early, Eli Lilly partnered with a couple of companies, Abcellera out of uh, Vancouver, Canada, um, helped us identify a very potent antibody, which is bamlanivimab. So this actually was derived from B cells, a uh, type of lymphocyte from patient who had recovered from COVID-19. Uh, we also partnered with a company called Junxi, who also had uh, 
derived an antibody at a sivimab, again, from B cells of a patient who had recovered from COVID-19 in China. Importantly, these two antibodies bind to different regions of the spike protein, spike protein that are non-overlapping, and we actually think that leads to some significant enhancement of the efficacies of monoclonal antibodies is to combine them together. And that's what our program has had always been designed. As you know, we started out with bamlanivimab. That was the first emergency use authorization. But very, very early in the program, we started combining bamlanivimab with edisivimab. And, and we knew that was going to be needed because we, we knew that this virus was going to change. It was going to evolve. And certainly we've seen that. And so we can just label that as variants for simplification mutations of interest, variants of interest, you'll see various terms. This program at Eli Lilly and Company was always designed uh, thinking about the potential of variants down the road. So we have now dosed uh, the combination of bamlanivimab and edisivimab over, over 1,350 trial participants. The majority of those are in a very large, um, very uh, adaptive phase two, three, phase three study called BLAZE-1. And then we have also BLAZE-4, which is a more pharmacodynamic-focused study where we try different combinations, including uh, shorter infusion times. And we also have programs for second-generation monoclonal antibodies that we've publicly disclosed. And we are testing those antibodies in this BLAZE-4 program. Again, what's emphasized, these are ambulatory patients. The monoclonal antibodies work early in the disease process. So we are studying in patients who are in the outpatient setting. I mentioned before that these antibodies are indicated for patients who are at high risk of going on to develop severe COVID-19. And we know that frequently leads, unfortunately, to ER visits, hospitalizations, and then unfortunately death. And we, we all see the, the devastating numbers coming out of India, but we've had uh, very devastating numbers coming out of the United States as well. And, so who is at high risk? Um, kind of a simple category all the, all the way over here to the right. Anybody 65 and, and older automatically qualify uh, if, if you have a positive uh, COVID-19 test, you, you qualify for uh, these antibodies. Um, this category here with the shaded box is that if you have a patient age, age, age ranging from 12 up to 64, and they have problems with obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or any, any immunosuppressive type disease or medication that would qualify a patient for monoclonal antibodies. And then for children in particular, uh, children who have various comorbidities that you see listed here would qualify if they did not have these uh, in the gray box. And then finally, we have another, another category. If you're age 55 to 64 and you have heart disease, high blood pressure, or chronic lung disease, uh, you would qualify. So these are uh, important categories. It, it is uh, in the authorization, emergency use authorization for these drugs. It's not encouraged to, to treat patients who do not fit these categories. That's uh, it's not something we, we certainly advise at all. We want you to finish, to, to follow the high risk category here. So the dose, uh, so again, 12 years or older, if you meet the high risk criteria, bamlanivimab 700 milligrams, adesivimab 1,400 milligrams, uh, diluted as directed by our fact sheet and administered together as a single intravenous infusion. We've worked hard to try to shorten that infusion time and we've, we've got that down to approximately 20 minutes with uh, some observation time after that. And that helps with throughput, getting people through the infusion centers or the emergency room where sometimes it's given. So what's the data? This is uh, at a very high level, the initial studies, and, and it led to, I think, uh, the early uh, authorization was reduction in viral load. So here we have a, about three lines here on the y-axis. We have uh, the change in viral load on the x-axis study day. Placebo is in orange here. Bamlanivimab by itself in green over time. And then the combination of bamlanivimab and edisivimab at the initial uh, phase three cohort, which was 
2,800 milligrams for each antibody. And you can see clearly that the combination of BAM and adesivimab really dramatically lowered viral load by day three, day seven, day 11, compared to bam lenivimab alone. In terms of the uh, clinical data, and, and this is, I think, where uh, obviously the, um, the rubber meets the road for a lot of clinicians as myself is reduction in COVID-19 hospitalizations or death by day 29. So this is our first phase three cohort. What you see here is we, we had 36 events or 7% of the patients. And unfortunately there were 10 deaths in the placebo group versus 11 events in the BAM and ed EDI group that was a rate of 2% developing COVID-19 hospitalization or death, and actually zero deaths uh, were observed in that group. So overall, that's a 70% reduction in, in events at a highly statistically significant uh, result. And you see this is the phase three data in terms of viral load. So again, compared to placebo, you see a, a very dramatic early reduction in viral load. Again, we talked about uh, adverse events. We looked at this very closely. If you look at overall adverse events, 13% in the subjects treated with BAM and Eddy together, 12% in the placebo treated patients. Again, we have a, a, an occasion of a hypersensitivity event, approximately 1%, but thankfully most of these resolve um, fairly quickly with treatment and stopping the infusion. So I mentioned that uh, Eli Lilly has been very, uh, very engaged in trying to provide uh, education for patients, for healthcare providers, for systems. It's been a great partnership um, with the uh, HHS, this, uh, th this website, combat COVID at hhs.gov, I think has been instrumental for, for many, many patients and I know has made a big difference. Um, you see that Lily has been uh, sending out various um, media uh, touches, if you will, that are not really referring to our antibodies. They're just generic, talking about COVID-19 treatments are here. So that would obviously point people to other potential therapies, such as the, um, the Regeneron um, monoclonal antibodies. So that's been a great partnership. I think it's, it's led to increasing success. We, we know that over 450,000 patients have received the Lilly antibodies in the U.S., and that translates into significant reductions in, in hospitalizations and even deaths. And so we're proud of, of those partnerships around education. Uh, it's been a common question that we have received, and as have others, uh, how do you find uh, an infusion center? How do you find an emergency room who's willing to to infuse uh, the, uh, the monoclonal antibodies. And so we've had a, a really great partnership with the National Infusion Center Association, NICA. So they have a very nice website that can help providers and patients and families find places for infusion very quickly. And also you can find that at the Department of Health and Human Services. And then finally, I think importantly for this group, it, it was uh, Eli Lilly and company's commitment very early that we would provide um, these, the, the thought would be these antibodies would be provided to patients at no cost. And so the U.S. federal government obviously stepped up in a big way to purchase, um, to purchase these antibodies for patients around the United States. And um, the idea was to do this at no cost. So the only potential cost because of the U.S. purchase of the antibodies would be infusion related expenses. And so thankfully the Medicare group has stepped up and expenses to, to administer the infusion are actually paid for under the CARES Act. So that's no cost. Many state Medicaid organizations, as I understand it, including New York have followed this model. And so it's certainly been our goal to work with those organizations so patients don't, uh, um, don't get stuck with any infusion related expenses. And I think that's been quite successful. So um, what I would say in summary is that Eli Lilly and company it's, has been very proud to, to uh, do what we could for, for patients in, in this pandemic. These antibodies have been approved in over 20 countries and four continents. Um, 
And so we are, we are proud of that. We continue to work on this problem with our, our second generation monoclonal antibodies. And um, with that, I'll close and uh, stop sharing and turn it back over to our moderator. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mark. That was, uh, that was terrific. Um, I guess one of the, the, the ways that we can kick this off is, you know, really where do we see the optimal role of kind of targeted therapies uh, with regard to COVID? Uh, and I would also say, you know, do we need to monitor, say, vaccination status uh, to stratify patients and thinking about how we're going to treat them, whether it's whether it's early or not? Does that affect our decision making? Um, so, James, why don't we go to you first on this one? Yeah, so the um, uh, I probably shouldn't get too much into the medical weeds, but I think the um, but if you look at like the NIH treatment guidelines, for instance, it's it's quite clear, like those guidelines see the sweet spot, you know, for remdesivir you know, with patients who are in the hospital and on uh, low flow oxygen. And then kind mm -hmm. of, you know, as you get more severe then you know, kind of to your stratification point, you know, then there's other unmet needs. And also, especially too, you know, uh, kind of before that, you know, there's a lot of unmet needs. And, and I guess, you know, I mean, what, one thing that could be interesting, uh, what others have to say is that uh, if you look at some of the big platform trials um, where they try to do multiple drugs against each other, um, they do have these ordinal scales, and in a certain way, that is kind of a, a stratification. Um, and so maybe that is uh, is a way we can we can think about uh, unmet needs where where we still need to plug the gaps. And I'll also say too that you know um, that of course then, then also in the developing world, people have you know you know very unique challenges with various settings, and that's one of the reasons why we're still kind of committed to trying to find an inhaled form. So, yep. Um, so I will go to uh, David quickly here. So what do you what do you think this has shown us a little bit about you know access over the past year, and that builds on really what what James had just said. So how do we think about uh, access to therapies, you know, really as an industry, um, with what we've seen in terms of how we've developed therapies for COVID? All right. Yeah, I think we've we've seen you know some some difficulty, especially on the on the antibody side, where you you have to go into a hospital and and be monitored. You have to have the the IV. So in terms of access, you know, running trials to to get that sub Q formulation and to potentially envision um, a setting that's potentially at a CVS like a vaccine where you can go in and get a sub Q injection of a Mab would increase that access. And then in terms of remdesivir as well, um, you know, it's, it's what Gilead had, uh, you know, was IV, but look at the effort that's being put into that inhaled version. If that works, or even some of these prodrugs that could be more soluble, maybe even in pill form, that's going to change the dynamics. And I think with COVID, it, the windows are extremely important in terms of when you actually get in with that treatment. And so it's not just you know, can you access it in the hospital? It's, it's what time did you get it after you were PCR positive? And that is critical that we're either either in that outpatient setting or something that can be readily available um, even in the doctor's office, not maybe the, the, the hospital with the, with the IV setup. So I, I think that we've, we've learned quite a bit, uh, but I think that also the, what was mentioned before, you know, how does vaccine treatment changes in terms of stratifying patients. Um, you know, in December, when all the vaccines were reading out, that was really a game changer. And I think the focus right now will be on the, whether it's 25% of the United States um, that refuses to get a vaccine, um, we, we're still gonna have this issue. Where we're still gonna have patients infected that refuse to get vaccinated, that is an issue. And of course, it's going to take another year at least to get the rest of the world vaccinated. And so I think we need to also think about access outside the border here in the United States and how we actually get these drugs to India, to Africa, to places where they don't have that infrastructure. And that's a huge challenge. It is. And I'm, I'm glad we brought up India before. Yeah, and I was Go gonna ahead, say, we had a question um, in the chat, um, which uh, David responded, I, th I think most of you can see it. But the question is around diagnostics, right? So timing is really important with, with treatment. Um, and how what we've seen, it's varied greatly depending on where you're located. But I'm just talking US now, where you're located, how your state had set up maybe mass testing sites, 
how internet savvy you are to find clinics that may have other testing sites. Um, what do you all, and I'll throw this to, you know, to all three, what do you see as our ongoing need for consistent testing? And will we get to testing in the home, right? Um, schools will require testing in order to identify and then treat patients that are diagnosed uh, positive with COVID. Well, I'll take, I'll take a stab at that. So we, um, as you might imagine, Eli Lilly and Company has been pretty invested in testing. We're not a diagnostic company. We, we, don't, we don't sell tests, but we, we certainly are pretty, pretty savvy when it comes to the various uh, types of testing. I think we need better rapid testing, quite honestly. I, I think you know the PCR based is very accurate. Sometimes we've been disappointed in, in the very rapid testing. You know, there, you can find home kits out there and things. Uh, that needs to continue to improve, certainly. Um, just think where we are a year a year later in terms of testing. So I actually myself had COVID in the middle of March last year, and as a critical care physician, it took me seven days to get a test. At, at that point, you know, we, we are just living in different times. So I, I'm actually optimistic that, that the testing will continue to, to improve and evolve. Yeah. Well, and, and for, I think for, I mean, as a parent with school age children, <laughs> I'm like, test them, test them, test them. So they can all get back in school uh, full yep. time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to shift gears on you just a little bit here. We had a question from the audience um, and David, maybe you can take a stab at this first. At what point will vaccines and therapeutics move from EUA to approval? What needs to happen for that um, regulatory change to occur? That's a good question. I, I think James might be able to answer this because we we have one example, you know, where that did happen with remdesivir, uh, where the, the 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 length of time in and and the size of the trials um, will will justify that over time, where you know, the conditions for full approval are met. And I think with with remdesivir, um, the totality of data pushed the FDA all the way to, to approval as that came in. But in the very beginning, um, you know, there, there were, you know, trials rolling in and it was obvious in the very early age of the pandemic uh, that we need something and we have a signal, we have a phase three trial uh, but then multiple phase three trials came and you take that totality of evidence, that's what the FDA needs to see for, for full approval. Yeah, and, and if I could add the, uh, you know, from the remdesivir experience as well, um, I totally agree with all of that. And I would also just add that there was um, a significant amount of safety data, both from, uh, from prior, prior products uh, with, you know, Ebola that you know, did not turn out successful or as desired from an efficacy point of view. Um, but also when, uh, you know, in the very early days when we were, you know, attempting to do some clinical trials with NIAID and with China and so forth, we basically also put everybody else we could find into a compassionate use program. Um, and that had a lot of complexities. We had to change it from individual to, you know, to, to centers and all this kind of stuff. But it did allow the, uh, the collection uh, of a lot more safety data. So, you know, in, in that respect, uh, there, there were, you know, actually some, some benefits uh, to the way we were able to collect that. And, and I, I don't know, you know, vaccines so much, but I would expect that, that there are tremendous opportunities to collect, you know, some of those other kind of data right now that could uh, support full. So, so from the therapeutic side, yeah, I would like to just comment. Um, I, I would actually argue it's a bit more complicated with an ambulatory uh, setting. So we, um, we would anticipate, you know, hopefully submitting for approval at some point, but we need to see how the variant landscape really settles, settles out because we have, you know, we have second generation uh, monoclonal antibodies in development now, and we need just to see what's the landscape, how can we predict six months from now, which will take, it'll take that long to really get a biologic license application together. What, what's the landscape going to look like? So um, it, it's a big lift, but it's uh, it's an important thing to try to get the full approval, certainly. Yeah, the, the average so, time going back to, to vaccines for phase three to approval is 1.4 years. So you take that into consideration where we are today. We're, we're very lucky to have these EUAs, but 
in terms of what the FDA has typically had to look at in terms of safety profiles over time, it is, it is somewhat long-term, even though most side effects occur in the first 90 days. Uh, but it's typically been these, these longer time frames. So I think time is really the, the key when you're looking at you know, long safety and, and long-term dosing. And we have no indication at all from the federal government that they would stop administration, right? It's, it's certainly not a situation where the EUA will run out and all of a sudden we won't have access, right? We're not seeing anything like that. No. So I, don't want I, I, like, I would oh, add one no. thing. <laughs> with, with, there are a couple of companies that are filing for EUA and they have uh, limited data, like larger phase twos or even mid-sized phase twos and they're, they're already you know, seeing a signal and moving to an EUA. I think in that case, it's going to take a lot longer. Whereas you know, Gilead and Eli Lilly have incredible data, phase three robust data, large amount of patients. And now we're many, many months past those yeah. timeframes. Um, but I think for these other companies, it's going to take a lot longer um, because they're not even at the, at the large phase three scale. So we've got a couple minutes left and uh, just to close out here and Mark, I, I would like you to take off your Lily hat for a second and put on your pulmonologist hat and uh, you know, think <clears throat> about really kind of what we've learned over the last year and, and where we would like to be a year from now. Yeah, great question. Where, where I would like to be a year from now is um, First of all, to have a multitude of options. I, I want the vaccines to, to be as, uh, <clears throat> as widely implemented as possible, but we know that's not likely. So I want, a, I want multiple tools in my toolbox. I want, yep. I want um, subcutaneous injections. I want oral antivirals to be used early. Um, Quite frankly, I've used remdesivir a lot, and I think it's been very helpful in a lot of my patients, but I would wish I'd never gotten there. So that, that's my dream, is that we, we get to the point where we don't have these patients, our intensive care unit, you know, clinging to life. That's, that's my dream. Yeah, well, I, think that's, I think that's the right place to go, and that's hopefully where we end up. And uh, I want to thank all of you. Um, you know, we, I, I think about this a lot when we do these, but you know, this is yet another example of looking at how amazingly uh, various companies, various organizations, various individuals, R&D teams have, have responded to an unprecedented challenge, which, as I said to James before, I hope, you know, no one ever has to do again. Uh, but we did have to do it this time, and the response has been amazing. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. This has been terrific. Uh, to all of our guests, remember all of our uh, episodes are available on YouTube. Uh, and hopefully this one will be up with all the others by the end of the week. So with that, I say thank you to all of you. I hope everybody has a wonderful day uh, and we'll see you next week Yeah, where we've got another great one coming up. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.